Good morning, friends. I think we are live. It's a pleasure introducing uh, you, friends, to this group of graduate scholars from Harvard School of Education. We have recently conceived uh, Education India Initiative, through which they are going to mentor teachers, students, educators, policymakers from India and maybe from rest of South Asia also about the need for education reforms in our part of the world. So uh, I'll be passing on the mic for a round of introductions. And meanwhile, we'll also be asking you to join us with your questions. You can ask your questions about the entire education system, how possibly we can go ahead from here and what are the problems and what are the possible solutions. So here we go. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, so happy to interact with people back uh, on the other side of the world. Yeah, my name is Murali, and I'm from Coimbatore, uh, Tamil Nadu, and I've been working as a fellow of Teach for India, and also with an NGO called Bhumi, designing curriculum for the supplementary education space. And also, I've been traveling around visiting alternative schools in the rural spaces. So I care about uh, decentralizing education and making education as relevant to the communities as possible. And uh, more work that I see in the society is trying to connect to our own immediate environment and then connecting to the outer world. So know about what is the environment around you, what are the possibilities around you, and then also connect to the bigger picture. Yeah, that's what I care about and I call it native curriculum. Yeah, now passing it on to Kum Kum. Good evening, friends. Uh, my name is Kumkum and I'm from Delhi. And uh, before coming to the Graduate School of Education, I have uh, I was working in the education space as a freelancer. And uh, I work with an NGO called Yuva Parivartan, which works with school dropouts and how vocational education and livelihood training can basically change their lives because they don't have access to formal education schools, colleges. So how can we find alternate ways to employ these people and help them make better their lives? Uh, the main areas I was working on with uh, students from school age, college age, and young professionals was on life skills and financial literacy, where uh, I think that these skills are very important to be learned early and which our current formal schooling systems are not doing well. So I'm trying to understand how to incorporate these skills into the current schooling system uh, as for the new policy reforms of skill development of national skill qualification framework and other policies. And what are the uh, loopholes from the policy end, basically? We have very beautiful policies uh, on paper. They are well thought and well documented. But when it comes to implementation, there are loopholes. Uh, from the state capacity side, from at the district level, at the school level. So I'm trying to understand those loopholes and how to cater them from the policy perspective while designing and implementing. Thank you. Some people are writing with the video. The, the audio is not clear. Can you please keep the mic a bit closer? Hello, everyone. It's really a big pleasure talking to all of you. My name is Payal, and I've been working back in India with Nonprofits like Azim Premzi Foundation and Kevalia Education Foundation for the last 10 to 12 years. My experience has largely been in the large scale system reform. And one of the things across these 12 years that has troubled me consistently is that how there is this general perception that the government school teachers, government school administrators do not want to work. I mean, there's a challenge to their their will, their intention, and I think that's a really, really disturb disturbing trend in a country like India where almost 70% of the education is dispensed through the public education system. So um, I think what I really want to work on is this whole idea of creating a really professional identity for teachers and administrators and also helping people understand that the system has a context. It is, it is not devoid of a context, and it has its own concerns, and it has its own problems. That doesn't mean that 
the invisibility of the context creates a perception which labels most of the people as redundant in the system. So I would really like to direct all my efforts in making the public education system as professional as possible. Hello everybody, good evening. Uh, uh, my name is Aditi. Um, I am studying international education policy here at Harvard. Um, before this, uh, when I was in class 11, I was really troubled by how everything we were doing was about exams. So I dropped out of school and I pursued uh, open schooling, which was uh, a really flexible, uh, good option. And that's got me thinking about how in India, uh, everything is decided by the examinations that we need to do. Um, and that's, uh, that's got me interested in three things. One, like Murli said, what are alternative ways of um, designing schools? Everything doesn't have to be rote learning, doesn't have to be you know, exam prep all the time. Um, the second is uh, if we only have people who um, are in the practice of road learning for exams, we don't have a thinking and a questioning democracy. Um, so we really need to reimagine spaces and environments where people can ask questions um, without fear. Uh, and that's something we need to develop early in children. Uh, and the third thing is that um, I'm interested in what are the skills that we want to build in our children apart from academic skills. So creativity, critical thinking, um, with all the challenges facing the world, it's going to be really important that we figure out what are the skills we want children to build and how we can do that. So these are my three areas of interest. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, thank you, Faisal, for uh, arranging this, setting this up. Uh, I'm very excited. Uh, my name is Sanjul Bhakri. I have been uh, living in the U.S. for the past two years and uh, been working in IT over the past decade. And uh, one of the reasons that I would want to uh, do a master's, I am uh, pursuing my school leadership program in uh, NGSC, which is the Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, is to build schools which are acting as platforms, not just uh, tools to build engineers or doctors or uh, lawyers. Uh, just a context, we, uh, as 1.3 billion uh, Indians, we produce around 30 million uh, engineers every year, but we did not even get one gold medal in the Olympics. So uh, we want schools to think about the overall development of uh, students, not just the curriculum uh, design and curriculum uh, cognitive skills. That's all I'll be doing. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Mernas and I'm very happy to be here and sharing this space with all my colleagues. Um, I have been working over the last three years in a special needs lab school back home in India. Um, and while being at this school, I have realized that the teachers and parents have the greatest intentions for children with learning disabilities but we often don't know how to cater to their needs. And there seems to be a limited understanding in this area. Um, I've also noticed that uh, from families, there's still um, a stigma attached to with um, educating these students. And uh, therefore, I feel while there's... Is the volume yeah. covered? Yeah. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. While there's limited... Um, sorry. Um, so I think my goal is similar to what Aditi was sharing. Um, I want to understand how deep learning can be personalized to cater to these students. If some students want to want or study best at home, um, they should have that uh, opportunity and how we can capitalize on those resources. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm Viveka. It's so nice to talk to you all. Uh, I'm here in the learning and teaching program at Harvard. Uh, I worked as a fellow with Teach for India. I taught uh, middle school for two years. I taught seventh and eighth standard. Uh, I taught maths and English. After that, I worked for a year in Chicago in different after school programs and in school programs that uh, supplemented the classroom. Uh, so I am very interested in how we can reimagine schools, just as Murli Aditya and Menna said. 
Uh, how can we reimagine them? How can we make it connected to the whole child? And especially, how can we empower teachers? Uh, and how can we change, help them change their practices so that they can cater to all aspects of the child? And how can they understand what the child is learning and support that? Uh, so can we can we talk a little bit about our experiences with the American education system? Now that we have been here, I'm sure uh, I'm sure. Uh, all friends would want to know about how American education system or how Western education system, many of you have worked in Europe also, how it is different from Indian, Indian education system, how the classroom here is different, how the teacher is different, how the entire teaching learning experience is different. Maybe we can share a couple of experiences about that. If you can maybe uh, maybe help us with the volume there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry uh, for the friends who are writing that the internet signal in Kashmir is weak. I was not aware about that. Uh, maybe we could have rescheduled this uh, podcast. But I'm sure a lot of people have still joined us. Maybe those of us who cannot join us live this time can still watch this video maybe later on. Thank you. So we are talking about the experiences with American education system. Um, one example that I uh, got is in my undergrad, I used to have classes from 8.30 in the morning until 4.30 in the evening. So it's almost like uh, you have uh, do the math eight hours a day, five days a week, so 40 hours of class. And the amount of workload related to 40 hours wouldn't be that much. But here I have maybe three hours of class a day, but the effort that I put to prepare for that is almost like 10 hours, 15 hours related to that. So here I feel education is a lot more intrinsic where people bring in their motivation and enrich the space around rather than just a listener mode, but an active participatory mode, which is something that I enjoy a lot. Yeah. So I think it would be very interesting if I talk about my experience, experience here. So, how is it? As Murli was also saying, that uh, it's all intrinsic. intrinsic. Uh, the focus is on the student, and you are driving your own course here. You have too much uh, autonomy over what you want to study, what kind of factors you want to study. What? Just like Basically, uh, what's it like? Uh, you can you have a you have a whole range of courses out of which you can choose, and then you get to choose you get to pick your own choice of courses depending on the kind of interests which you have. Maybe Kumkum can maybe project the uh, voice till we get our mic back. Okay. So uh, what happens is you you are directing your own learning. You have uh, autonomy and flexibility to choose whatever you want to study. It can be anything in your school, outside your school. If you think you want to marry behavioral economics with how it can be taught in the classroom or how design thinking can be applied to policy. So all these kind of interdisciplinary approaches can be uh, are available here and you're free to choose them. So you, you just have to work on what you think is good for you and you have all the resources here. So the entire approach of, uh, of uh, where in India it's more directed by uh, the teacher, it's here directed by yourself and the professors and the system is here to facilitate what you want to do. Yeah, you can pull the chair close to the, uh, the laptop just until we get more cells. Oh, you, can just I got okay. you can talk about it. Uh, I think it's, it's very similar to what Tonkin just described here. It's very, um, um, so it's like a menu. It's like a right. huge menu available to you based on um, uh, based on what uh, interests that you may have. I think what happened with me personally was also that uh, um, the availability of menu gave me more understanding of what all is possible within my interest area. So when I when I came here, I was imagining learning and teaching to be. Um, uh, still from my frame of reference that this is the X, Y, Z things that I wanted to do. But when I looked at the hundred things that were available here, it also opened my mind to think about learning and teaching in a completely different kind of a way. So I think that's the function of options, this whole thing of options that played for me. 
Another thing that I think is working really well for me here is uh, the accessibility to professors. Um, it's not an extremely hierarchical relationship with your professors that you share. They are really accessible. You can go to them with any sort of question. Uh, they can be your brainstorming partners and not just somebody who would like kind of uh, tell you what to do, but they can really partner in thinking through the questions, the thoughts, the basic vague ideas that you might be grappling with. So I think that's an interesting uh, experience in the sense that uh, I think that is what we are trying to turn around in India. This uh, uh, this whole tradition of guru shishya pranali jo hamare desh mein chalta aa raha hai because of that there is uh, the respect has kind of translated into reverence and reverence to fear for teacher but i think uh, the whole reimagining of teacher as a facilitator the education system as a facilitator of an individual's growth that seems to be an interesting experience here and i'm taking a lot from that I think one of the best things over here is that uh, all professors have really, really high expectations uh, from you. But love substandard work to accept in karenge. But the good thing is that with the high expectation, there's also a lot of support uh, available to you. So if you're finding uh, some maths problems difficult, you can get into a study group. You can take help from TFs. So TFs are usually PhD students who help a professor to conduct their classes. They are always available for clearing doubts. Um, so it's like having an aid. Um, for, it's for, every professor has that one person who takes care of these, almost some, all the administrative things so that the professor can totally focus on teaching. That's one thing that I feel is something that we can definitely take back to India so that we can place, uh, allow teachers more time to just teach. Um, so yeah. Uh, I would like to start by saying that it's uh, American culture is fascinating um, around treating a child like an adult. So be a pre-nursery student or nursery student or a K2 or K6 or K12 student. Uh, the adults, they treat children as adults and that's what makes a lot of difference. By the time a student comes out of a school, they are um, treated with respect and they know that they have to take care of their own uh, 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 deliverables in life and in school. So I guess that's something which, which I would like to bring back to our countries. Since uh, my peers have spoken about um, the relationship they share with the professors and the faculty here, um, I wanted to share about something that stood out for me was the pure learning that I felt like was lacking back home in India. In India, you would come into a class, the teacher would give a lecture and you would go home and that's when studying would start. Um, something that happens here is you are given three readings prior to the class. So you prepare for the class, you come into the class with that background knowledge. So there's this foundation after which you can interact with your peers your um, professor um, be coming from that background, which I thought was different and um, has helped me a lot in the process of learning. It's okay now. All right. Uh, I think one thing I would like to add with what everybody has said, especially what I said. about um, what I was saying uh, with the options, I think it forces you to choose in the sense that it forces you to be aware of what you really want. Uh, and it, you have to think for a while, this is what I want to do, this is what is relevant to that. I think it gives you a choice of what you want to be. Otherwise, you're just going by the system and they're just moving you along and you're not thinking what you doesn't have, and the menu is giving you, like it's forcing you to choose and reflect on in why you're doing what you're doing. Can I share my fun fact? Maybe that will open up the discussion and make it a little bit less, less formal. So one of the most, uh, I think, interesting experiences which I had with the American 
education system was that uh, I remember a class here where the teacher came and he was wearing shorts and he was wearing a chapa and he was not necessarily very formal with us and we had the freedom to address him with his first name and that was kind of a surprising thing for me because back home how we treat our teachers is like our teacher should be he must be very well dressed he must be having a uniform i remember when i was director of school education a lot of people told me that oh teachers should have uniform in fact why are they not wearing uniforms come on teachers should be in the school at the right time that's accepted but we expect teachers to follow a certain code of conduct certain moral behavior that's okay but we want also them to follow a certain way of dressing a certain way of talking a certain way of distance from the student i think those distances are not here the teacher is focused on teaching and learning other things what the teacher does every other thing what the teacher stands for we have no concern with that teacher is giving his best and and the student is learning his best i think that's that's something which i think we need to talk more about how the teacher student relationship here is a little bit more informal how it's more friendlier than back home so i see it as rather uh, over here it's not a teacher student relationship it's mostly like everyone is uh, in sense of equality it's like everyone contributes and even when you are being an international student you bring your experiences and you contribute to the learning of the entire class so teacher is person who has some experience who can facilitate the people around you are the people who contribute so you play a very very active role and there is no hierarchy of like one person is the one who has the who is the vessel of knowledge and other people are receiving so everyone has their own share in co-creating the knowledge and learning that everyone has yeah i think uh, each student here and each teacher and each faculty member part of the team of the teacher of the professor is like a separate entity who has equal say in who has equal worth and value in the entire system so you are not considered to be uh, a student here you are already considered to be a professional and that you're already contributing to the field you've come here for so you will be listened you your thoughts will be valued equally and yeah that's what we were saying that no hierarchy no formal so it's totally normal if you're going on uh, with a lunch with your professor so yesterday what happened we went on a school visit to maine and in our car there was a professor and for half of the way i didn't could i i wasn't able to make out that she was a professor and i was uh, thinking that she's a teacher uh, she's a student so because the that would not happen i think in india we would be too cautious if we are with our professors or what to say what not to say we not be personally attached to them and we would not know where are they coming from what are the challenges they have faced in being where they are so that here is very fluid so you have you i don't see any walls here between colleagues between professors between any kind of staff and support systems we have so that really enables everyone to focus on what they want to and not on what you're wearing where you're eating mm -hmm. you you're, you're in a class and you you will be eating your breakfast your lunch and nobody would care about it the professor would work in any work in any way this is a very important point yeah. i think uh, uh, here you can come to classroom i think most of the classrooms and you can bring your lunch with you you can bring a cup of coffee with you you can have a cup of coffee and the teacher doesn't feel bad teacher is also carrying a cup of coffee with that that makes the learning environment very informal it makes it very friendly i would also want you to talk about uh, the focus on questioning the focus on interaction the focus on giving the students to ask more questions to take control of the classroom than the teacher taking control of the classroom uh, i'd pause on like any other people who would like to answer this So um, not just in universities and colleges, uh, we we just saw that school yesterday, and uh, a lot of feedback coming from students who were like 15, 14 years old, and teachers incorporating that that change in their overall process. That shows that the mutual respect is given to every individual, every student. It was fascinating to see how students were so energized. and so uh, empowered to challenge their own teachers and the process and it's just not uh, dictatorship in a, in a school in a k12 school especially, uh, especially 
So uh, that's something which which we should be looking uh, into uh, back home. That in in K twelve schools Can we should tell be... a bit more about what these K twelve schools are like because I also want to understand what what, what how these K twelve schools are like our schools back in Canada. Sure, sure, sure. So K twelve is essentially kindergarten to twelve standard. Yeah. That's what they call it. <clears throat> now. Uh, they have split these schools into three parts. Uh, it's elementary, uh, secondary, and uh, I think it's high school. High school is from ninth standard to 12th standard. Elementary is, I think, four to uh, six or seven. Um, and then elementary is uh, are the younger uh, kids. So they were implementing a, a competency-based learning, the school that we visited uh, yesterday. And one, one of the biggest parts of that competency-based learning is building confidence and making sure that students are designing and building their own path to a competence. So they will, teachers will tell you what you have to study, like you don't have a choice uh, if you choose to study math or not, but you'll have a choice to design your path to learn math in your own way and what works for you and what, uh, what makes it work or what makes it pick for you. So that's something which which is pretty unique and pretty interesting uh, to see in, in the schools here. And uh, teachers are pretty receptive of the feedback and uh, they'll bring, bring it back to the principal and they will work uh, to actually bring that change in the classrooms. So that's fascinating. That's something which I think culturally we have to bring back to our country. I think one fun fact and also um, one way that has really changed my thinking is first uh, week we have a shopping period where we can go listen to professors about the courses that they are offering. And for this one course, my professor came with his five-year-old daughter. And she was really cute. But what he was really doing was saying that, number one, uh, he was being a role model because as a father, he was saying, you know, I have responsibility to bring my, like she's six, so she had to stay with one of her parents. He brought her to class and that was completely fine. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the other thing they keep, the, I think they, they tell us is that you have a life outside of your work and your academics and that's okay. Like you don't have to be ashamed of it. You don't have to completely hide it. And it makes the professor very relatable. So he's also like a normal husband, father or whatever. So that was really nice. Classrooms there. What, what unique things you felt? I think most of it has already been spoken about. Uh, I think what's interesting is that there is no um, either or there's not a strict choice between comfort and rigor. I mean, you could be comfortable and at the same time you could be applying rigor. And I think that's um, it's high time that we understand that, that there are no strict codes of conduct. Only if you look like extremely studious with your attention panned to the professor that you're really learning. I think you could be really relaxed. You could really have all the mind space in the world that you want to have and you could still learn and you could still be adequately rigorous and nobody could really challenge that you're not paying attention. I think that's a, that's a, that's a nice balance. That's a, that's a recognition of the fact that as people, we... There is this not a strict frame that we can always be restricted to. Learning has to be a relaxed, learning has to be a fun, learning has to be a more meaningful experience. And for that, there are a lot of efforts to make it rather more meaningful. In fact, uh, in our departments, uh, uh, people openly, the teaching staff openly acknowledges that uh, teaching can sometimes, learning can sometimes really get to your head. So we had yesterday a speed dating event within our department, uh, within which, uh, we just met all of our uh, cohort members, 30, 40 of us met um, in a room. There was a lot of free food and we just had to quickly talk to each other and went out or discuss something. Or But it was the only condition was that you're not going to talk about what did you do in the class or what do you want to do after the class. So anything beyond that that you want to exchange with your peers, uh, we have organized a space for you and you can just own it. Yeah. In fact, uh, back in our part of the world, what happens is, um, you know, we believe in chasing the teachers. We believe that the teacher has to be always chased with a stick by maybe his chief education officer, by his CEO, by his director, by his politician. Only then the teacher will be delivering. Only then the teacher will be serious about teaching. 
you guys have been to main school yesterday. Could you also tell us a little bit about what kind of monitoring is being done here? Because in my system, my experience, which I saw here, I didn't see anybody telling the teacher to teach. This is part of his inherent intrinsic value system that he has to teach and to teach the best. Uh, I think not only in the main school, but I've visited about three or four schools uh, in the recent past, uh, in the past one month. And uh, some of the best schools that stood out, and the principals had this one line, these teachers are amazing teachers. I've hired the best teachers possible, and they're doing a great job. They are designing the lesson, and they know how to make the student learn. And they know how to engage the student. My job is not to monitor the teacher or micromanage. The teacher is doing such great work that she should be allowed to, but not really be monitored or like checked or assessed all the time. But also, I think the important point is to hire somebody who really wanted to teach in the beginning, and that was an important fact that they wanted to. The they had an interest in that teaching itself, and when they hired this kind of people, they didn't have to monitor. But you, 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 you. It's a very important point which I want to score on the score uh, so that we can talk a bit more about it. So here, uh, the system is that the schools enjoy a lot of autonomy. The school autonomy is there. That means uh, the, the school principal or the school headmaster, he has the freedom to hire teachers. In our part of the world, even the principal secretary does not have the power to hire teachers. There has to be a very detailed process. Here, the principal has the flexibility that you go into the market, you look for the best people, and then you choose those best people, and then they remain accountable to you, and then you take work from them. I think we can talk a little bit more about how school autonomy here works to the advantage of the system here. Yeah. So, um, just while we are kind of comparing the American and the Indian or the South Asian uh, uh, education system, I think. Uh, like Fezal pointed out, uh, autonomy definitely adds a lot of value to, uh, because it gives you a choice, like how we were sharing a few minutes back that because we had choice here, our experience of getting educated here is significantly different than not having choice. I mean, even um, the whole psychological motivation that I have that this is what I have chosen for myself kind of drives me. But at the same time, I just want to also uh, uh, bring to surface that uh, just because it was autonomous, we should start believing that that's what is doing all the magic here. I also want to point to a small caveat here that the latest experiments uh, the Obama government uh, that did was to bring into teacher education a major reform, which was this, which was challenging this whole problem of autonomy. Okay. So the whole American education system was kind of is kind of based on uh, this notion that once you hire the best teacher, you don't need to monitor them, and that has kind of called, that has kind of turned into a problem for the American education system because the assumption is leading to not really supporting teachers adequately because you feel that you have the best one, so they don't need support. Uh, anybody can teach after, like education does not need continuous uh, uh, development, continuous support and all of that. So current uh, reforms are really trying to turn that upside down and they're trying to see that performance has to be a measure of teaching. Just because I was really good at in my BA kind of a training here, that does not kind of guarantee that I will be. So yes, there are really supportive structures which lead you to get into system people who are really interested, but that doesn't mean that that's kind of a, a solution, a midas touch to all the problems that we, so I just want to bring this little bit of caveat also to the discussion. My point of highlighting this was because it, it's also related to the kind of dignity which we give to the teachers. Sure. Yeah. Because if you can trust your principal, if you can trust your headmaster with hiring his teachers, with running the affairs of the school, only then possibly we can develop a certain sense of leadership in that principle. And that's how I was connected. I, I just wanted to add to Pyle's point to say that actually here, like recent in recent years, test-based accountability has become very big. So if your students don't score above a certain percentage, you can be fired. 
um, and that's pro like in a way is good because you are like you need to keep performing. But the problem is, um, is it a teacher's fault if they are handling a very difficult classroom and their students are not able to reach that you know percentage growth? It's not their fault, and they could be fired for it. In India, if we had such a uh, policy, teachers would revolt. Right? It's it's not their fault. So each of these reforms have pros and cons, and we need to be mindful of that. As I say, that in America, we have teachers. They have very very Obviously, big problems yeah, we have here. Problems here as well. yeah. I think uh, so. I I would uh, sort of challenge what you guys have just said because uh, in US, the education system works in a in a very different way. Uh, essentially, the state and the local governments they are running the public schools. Seventy percent of the school revenue or school uh, funding is coming from the local governments. Twenty percent is coming from the state government. Only ten percent is coming from the federal government. So that means every district has a different policy, has a different style, and has a different uh, framework for teachers to follow. And that's what uh, you know brings me to the second point, which is practice what you preach. Now, if they are giving students the freedom to choose their path to learn. Teachers have uh, the freedom to choose the path to teach, and uh, <clears throat> some teachers they do have uh, some ground rules to be in the class, and some pe uh, some teachers they just uh, are super flexible and they can allow students to you know study remotely and then bring in their assignments in different formats, which is something uh, uh, which shows that you know we <clears throat> we are giving the freedom not just to the students but to the teachers as well. And that comes from again, it's a cycle uh, that that has been running for generations. Uh, being a teacher is a great thing here. Uh, people choose to be a teacher, and uh, as you can see in Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education, we have uh, around 600 students every year coming who are teachers who want to be in education, who have chosen this field, and they are doing a lot of research on improving this constantly. So I think that as a culture, they Acknowledge the value of teachers, and they have uh, tried proactively to give them uh, the financial support that they need to be a good teacher, to be uh, a good professional. I think that's a very, very important point. I think if there's one value which I would want that gets kind of imported from this system, uh, I can. I, I'm, I'm projecting my voice. That's why I want to keep the mic there. It's okay. So I'm just trying to kind of give a perspective that if it's not possible. For us to kind of import education systems, and it's not desirable as well. We cannot say maybe American education system is the best, so let's get it there. A lot of people were asking about Korean education system. There was a question on the education system in Finland. I have been talking about the education system in Finland with my colleagues at the Kennedy School. It's not possible and desirable possibly because there's a cultural context to education. But then if there are certain values which we can maybe possibly Get back to our country. So one of the important value would be what what you talked about that the kind of dignity which the teacher has here. Teachers are not accidental teachers. Teachers yeah. are teachers by choice. Yeah. They want to become teachers. Yeah. I would actually like to challenge what you said on that because uh, one of my courses is this. I've been visiting schools every week. We've been studying each school. We've been talking to the principals. We've been talking to the teachers and the students. And I'm just my whatever I'm saying is based on this past six weeks of visiting schools, is that actually teachers do not have autonomy. It is extremely uh, monitored, and there are a few schools which they call pilot schools, uh, which are or charter schools, which are supported by the district. The money is given by the district, but freedom is given. That is like exactly. one school, one school in hundred. We are talking about the autonomy of the school heads. No, I'm, I'm yeah. going with yeah. the same thing. That depends on the head. district. So you might have visited a few schools in a particular district. And that's why I mentioned you can't generalize it because every district has a different policy. For example, uh, DCPS, that's District of Columbia Public Schools, they run their financial systems in a very different way. They pay their teachers in a different way. They have like a key performance indicator for each of the teacher. How the students doing? How the teachers are uh, engaging with the community? Uh, and uh, Boston Public Schools, they are running in in a totally different way because they are funded uh, in a different way. They are following a different framework. So <clears throat> that's what uh, you know differentiates the overall uh, model of American education is that 
uh, for example, in, in the districts of Maine that we visited yesterday, one of the principals, he said that my daughter is coming to my school, but I live in a different district. And those districts are doing things differently. But I want my daughter to come to my school because we are doing things differently. So they have a choice to do, uh, to do things differently, go to uh, different districts and do uh, uh, their education and learning in a different way. And that's what differentiates. And that's what, uh, where the autonomy comes. Like local districts, they have the power to change uh, and reform their own schools if they choose to. If parents are loud enough, the local government are very powerful to impact the education system for that local district. That's, that's I think, a cultural uh, thing as well, but that's, that's what happens. Okay. I, yeah. I have a question. I want uh, to ask you a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, when you talk I mean, we can endlessly debate about what's good here and what's bad there. And, uh, I don't think no, that's no, a point. Exactly. I, think, uh, I think what you pointed out in terms of uh, what is in terms of values, what is in terms of certain practices that we can take back to our country? Um, so just because you've, you've headed the uh, education department in Kashmir, and I was just wondering that, um, like we, we, we're talking about teacher autonomy, so I'm just kind of interested in having a conversation around that. What would it really, really take in our country to give teachers some, if not, I mean, I, I'm sure 100% autonomy is going to be a long, long way. But what we could really do to give some sense of empowerment to our teachers, our principals. I was recently working with school coaches and um, the government of Gujarat has recently done an interesting uh, initiative. They've kind of opened up the post of the coaches to anybody. Anybody can sit in the exam and come to be a part of the coaches. And I spoke to many of them. They were very young, aspiring people who wanted to contribute to education. But eight months down the line, they were like, we don't no. have the freedom. So I'm just, I just, yeah. I'm just wondering that if, if autonomy is something we are feeling here as a group that is really adding value to the system here, what is it that we can really do to bring it back? I mean, I think that would be a more, that is, that's a conversation that I think I'll be able to take something back from that. How, how is it yeah. that I work in, go back and work that I can talk about autonomy, I can advocate for it, and I can really put in place some systems that you could do. So if you could share some yeah. your experience in one. I think one of the regrets which uh, I would possibly have for a long time would be that uh, while I headed the education system in Kashmir, uh, we could not open up the organizations. The structures which were actually implementing the education system, those structures were highly hierarchical because we are actually in our country, we are actually living within a feudal system. We have a, we have a legacy. So the entire education policy structure, the entire departmental structure is extremely rigid. And in that rigid frame, the teacher doesn't figure anywhere. I think when I was heading the department, we were so much caught up with other issues that teacher autonomy, the teacher dignity, the, the issues of bringing teacher back to the focus. I think that was not something which we were immediately looking at. Our approach of reaching to the teacher was that, okay, the te this teacher is not working. We had a very negative, cynical, pessimistic view of the world, world there. We would say, oh, this teacher is not working, so we need to chase him, we need to punish him. I think I myself have made a mistake that maybe I would visit schools. I have never sought permission of the teacher before entering a classroom. I think this is one value which I realized here, that even if as a school administrator, even if as a very senior officer, you want to enter a classroom to inspect, you must first ask permission of the teacher because that classroom space belongs to the teacher. It doesn't belong to, the, belong to you, even if you are the teacher supervisor. Second, once you visit the classroom, the bureaucrat or the school officer or somebody who is not exactly into academics, we get into the paraphernalia of education. We get into attendance. We get into midday meal. We get into uniform. We get into, is the board cleaned or not? We get into, are the chairs available or not? We are not actually focusing on the actual core of the education there. I think that's one critical problem, that we don't get our priorities right. And the day we start actually getting away from our hierarchical feudal structures, I'm sure we'll be able to focus on school autonomy, and we'll be able to trust our teachers. Mr. Mohammed Rafi Saab 
He has been a director of school education where his goal was also, I was checking on the, on the, on the comments, he also thinks that uh, school autonomy is something, or the teacher autonomy is something that we need to work upon, and we need to actually trust our teachers. I'm not sure, as a society, are we ready to trust our teachers, because the trust on teachers also generates from a kind of societal trust on teachers. First, when the teachers have dignity in the society, only then the teacher will have dignity in the department. Extending this conversation, uh, one thing that I enjoy a lot over here is the independence that I have as a student. And now, even when we talk in terms of autonomy, bringing autonomy to the teachers itself is a far-fetched reality. Now, can we think of giving autonomy to the students itself? Because some of the classrooms that I've seen which have worked more effectively is where students also have a say in their experiences. In probably like, we enjoy choosing our subjects. Can we give that same to the students over there? So in this uh, bureaucratic system where we think of centrally monitoring, can such amount of decentralization be possible? Is it even a, uh, a far-fetched utopian thought to think of that students also need to have the autonomy? And how can this be made a reality with the government system? Uh, I think talking about autonomy should it is incomplete without talking about providing the skills and tools for autonomy if you give autonomy to somebody who does not know what to do uh, that makes yeah, it more challenging yeah, it's really risky uh, it, yeah it is risky like uh, if you give autonom autonomy to a teacher who does not know how um, how a good teacher works then it's a challenge and same goes for students now if you give them a proper framework and that's what uh, the main schools were doing. They uh, they went to a research company. They brought uh, the research done by that company, and they brought that framework. They trained the teachers. They trained the students. And once that training was done, uh, they had the skills and the will to do uh, and bring that change to the classroom. And now, if you talk to any student, uh, uh, there were around 2,100 students in those schools. If you talk to any one student, they will know the framework by heart. They will know what they are supposed to do, and they will autonomously do it. And that's what goes with the teachers as well. So I think asking about um, autonomy without thinking about how can we provide the tools and enable them and empower them to use those tools independently, I think that's something which, which is a bigger question. Like, what do we do to make sure that they are able to do what they want to do by themselves? I have an example to share. Yeah. I think I was telling this to uh, Viveka yesterday that um, like we all see Finland as a pinnacle example for a perfect system of education and uh, one thing which they do is give a lot of autonomy to their teachers so one African country actually tried to copy that and they gave too much autonomy to their teachers but it drastically failed because okay. and later they realized that they, their teachers didn't even have basic competency levels to deal with autonomy, which a very even low performing teacher in Finland would have. So while uh, this also brings to the aspect of how can we import policies or systems from other countries on to what level and uh, how these large scale assessments like PISA and TALIS should be interpreted in, in a country specific context. We would, it's very easy to go and say, oh, Shanghai is performing highest on PISA or this country is doing this, but we need to come down and ask what what will suit in our context. Right. And we, and these policies or changes will not work in isolation. If we put the entire responsibility on the teachers of a school leader or on a, just on a teacher or just on the students, the blame game kind of thing yeah. we do, that will not solve anything. And I think your point earlier that you know, principals have the autonomy, they're trained to uh, get that autonomy. They're not like <coughs> uh, yes. following the status quo and they've been teaching for a few years and then they become the principal. No, it doesn't work like that. They have to be properly trained and uh, educated to get to that level so that they can, you know, they have the freedom to. We can maybe now talk about one idea which possibly we would want to see being implemented back there once we go back. So I'll start with mine. One idea which I think is something which is very important for us is uh, how do we possibly reduce the, the stress level in the classroom? Uh, 
Uh, I had to recently send my kid to the school. I did show up for a lot of schools, and I think for all those months and weeks, I think one thing which we're worried about is that how will our kid deal with that stress in that classroom? Because it's very difficult to send your child to an environment where we know that what kind of relationship is going to be between the teacher and the student and the student and the other students. I mean, I remember myself, it used to be a very, very stressful feeling to go to the school. We don't want to go to the school because it's not fun anymore. So I think how do we make our schools fun? How do we make our classrooms interesting for the kids? Because the kid would want to go to the school. You don't have to push him all in time. You don't have to beat him all in time that, oh, you have to go to the school. What kind of incentives can we maybe create within the classroom for the student and within the school for the student? So the student feels like going there and learning and making the learning environment a bit more friendly. I think that would be one reform which I would be very interested in getting implemented back home if I ever get a chance back in education. Uh, uh, let me start with just an uh, example of what I want to be. So just like how a seed grows. Uh, the seed grows into a tree and tree can be the tallest only when its roots are the deepest. So I see education as where we learn about probably uh, all the rivers in India or all the different like uh, soil types all over India, all the different resources. Do we know about what are all the resources near us? So are we aware of what are all the uh, be ponds or probably the scientific uh, resources near us and then think of taking it further? So unless we are connected to our immediate surroundings, and we just think of taking for uh, going to some other place. Education, we will be only a tool to uproot you and take you to some other place rather than apply the mechanical knowledge or the IT that you learn in patterning the world around you. So I will look at making the curriculum and content as relevant as possible to the immediate surroundings. Okay, I'll uh, that is one change making the curriculum as immediate and relevant to the people. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. yeah, why not? Okay, yeah. so we have a question in the comments asking how can we get into Harvard or Stanford or any other top universities of the world with average grades. So I am here, I have very average grades and I was never a top performer either in my school or my college and most of the people we see around here are not top scorers. So what they value here is what you bring as a package, what skills you have, what you've done and what you want to, why you want to study here. Basically, you need to have the clarity for that so that uh, X person is not studying Y because just because Z is studying the same thing. So here it's, you need to have that clarity and that would show in your statement of purpose, would show in the people who like uh, will write the letters for you. Uh, so clarity is very important and uh, how you bring your what and what you want to study and then take it forward to do what you wish to. So that line of thought has to be very clear with you. And yes, definitely different components of applications need to be met, but it's not score uh, score centric here, especially in the US system. However, in other countries, I think uh, in UK, I feel that there's a lot more pressure given on academic ability, uh, but here, I think it's more of your overall in overall capacity to be in a system and to contribute. So that really depends. And obviously, it's a it's a very uh, brief way to answer that question. But we could uh, talk about that in detail in our any Next other one, session. Yeah. Yes. We are talking about the same question. We are talking about one idea which okay. we would yeah. want to take forward. Um, I think, uh, like I said in my introduction, that uh, the fact that teachers and administrators are not really looked at as professionals and even their preparation is not really geared towards uh, preparing them to really act and behave like professionals, I think that that's, that's one area that I really, really want to contribute to because um, like Murli was earlier saying, that can we start with giving autonomy to students and Sanjul said that if they're not prepared for autonomy, it's not going to work. So I think I, I just really worry that is, if starting from student is the right space or not. I think I, I would really like to start at a place where, um, I mean, uh, just imagine an autonomous teacher sitting in front of a scared teacher. 
students sitting in front of a scare teacher. That would be the most disastrous of setting that we can really uh, create. So I think, uh, yeah, teacher preparation, coach preparation is something that I'm really passionate about. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, I'll, I'll start by kind of answering uh, your question. Uh, one factor that, uh, I mean, I faced the same thing when I was a kid. I was super scared um, to go to school. And uh, one of the factors which impacts the, the liking or disliking or fear or happiness of a child is uh, personalized learning. For example, um, if you ask a fish to... Um, to jump a tree, and then you'll be graded on the basis of that. Of course, the fish will die of fear um, and die coming out of the water. But uh, I want to build schools uh, in India which are focused on personalized learning. Every student has innate abilities to do something or the other. We need to identify that. We need to uh, cultivate that and make them the best versions of themselves. I think that's something which uh, schools are not doing. They're just standardizing everything and making uh, sure that they're measuring everyone with the same sick, that doesn't work. Personalized learning, competency-based learning, and um, giving them a platform to grow is something that I want to do, and I will link schools around that. Um, I think my takeaway is similar to Sanjul's. Um, I've been doing this course called Universal Design for Learning. Um, we were studying how scientific um, neurodiversity and how it explains how every child is unique and how it is important for us as teachers to ensure that we are catering to the needs of every single learner. And um, two different principles and frameworks, of course, um, we've explored a lot of assistive technology, but we know in India we don't, may not have as many resources. And therefore, how can we as teachers be creative and still meet the need? of all the students in our classroom who are so diverse. Uh, I think my answer is a combination of what Murli said and the discussion about teacher autonomy. I ultimately want to see schools that are very connected to the student. Uh, and for that, we cannot have one standardized curriculum because everybody is so different. So how can we give teachers the autonomy to make sure that they can relate the child and the world around them. And I want to see that in, in schools, and I want to have design schools like that. That's what I want to do. Thank you. I think education is a subject on which the conversations can go on and on and on. And uh, we have just tried to kind of introduce the subject today. And uh, the kind of comments and the kind of participation questions which we saw coming to us, I think it has given us a perspective on the kind of conversation we would want uh, to have next time as we meet. Uh, we are not being able to reply to all the questions and take all the comments. Uh, I'm also sorry that many people, many friends in Kashmir could not watch us because of the internet issues, but still I can see some comments from Jammu, Ladakh, from the rest of the country, from other countries in fact. We had some very important people from the country also watching us who have a say in the education policy, uh, in the media, and in public life. So I think this effort for today, I think it has been successful to an extent. We hope to carry forward these conversations in coming days. Those of us who could not watch us live could, can possibly watch this video after this. We'll be coming back to you with next podcast, possibly again on education next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.